revolutionary symbol of industrial, endable and durable production techniques ever invented. Consider this. One factory, the Hyundai Motor Manufacturing Plant in Montgomery, Alabama, has the ability to produce 300,000 automobiles per year. That's a thousand cars a day. Formless coils of steel enter the assembly line and emerge as cars. Along the way, there's a whole lot of stamping, welding, painting. Need for speed. Industrial society was highly advanced at the time the assembly line came into being. But once it came into being, uh, it was so productive that very few things were made without the line after that. There are several factors that went into the making of the assembly line. The first had to be that the parts of the history of mass assembly. The primary inspiration for putting work in motion originated in the 19th century disassembly lines of Cincinnati meatpacking facilities. The idea being that uh, a cow or a pig uh, was grabbed up by the hind uh, legs and uh, essentially put on a, a moving line and was successively uh, slaughtered, uh, gutted, and then butchered all in a moving line basis. In the 1850s, simple conveyors developed by textile manufacturers were used to move heavy molds filled with hot iron in the production of steel. Several decades later, can manufacturers created an elaborate system of conveyors designed to efficient operations. The principles were designed to break down a particular job into smaller and smaller tasks, which meant that much of the task could be controlled, mechanized, and thus speeded up. This process would require more men with less skills. Effectively, he tailorized the work and took the skill out of the work process, dividing the labor. Assembly lines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to assembly lines on Modern Marvels. The wondrous technology of the assembly line uh, effectively was its under undoing relative to labor. Henry Ford invested millions in machines that mechanized most of the jobs on the moving assembly line. And while the production tech... ...an absentee rate, you have to have 1,400 extra workers to fill the assembly lines. People didn't want to do these jobs, and it required the bait of considerable increase in wages to keep people in those factories. Ford's response to the growing labor crisis made him a hero. He doubled assembly line wages to $5 a day and shortened the workday from nine hours to eight. By 1914, the assembly line worker made five times more than the average American, whose annual income was an estimated $334. The assembly line worker could now afford to buy the Model T he was building. It worked. Turnover uh, dropped, uh, absenteeism dropped, and Ford workers, you know, sort of traded the high wages for the rotten work. With the mechanical assembly line setting the pace, Ford enjoyed unparalleled success throughout the first two decades of the 20th century. In 1919, graphs and other things, which are, should be much simpler. They look good, don't they? They taste good, too. Ford's method of mass production, however, required mass consumption in order to maximize profit and minimize cost. That simple formula would ultimately prove to be the undoing of some early manufacturers. But that didn't stop any of them from applying the new assembly line technology. There are new products coming on uh, into the home. Foster Gunnison liked to see himself as the Henry Ford of housing. Uh, he built a, a factory that uh, built houses, uh, very simple houses with simple wall structures on a moving line basis. A lot of things that actually went into custom built homes had actually been mass produced, things like fixtures, things like uh, um, uh, bathtubs, etc. that those were already mass produced. A study conducted at that time concluded that for some reason, with regard to housing, Americade manufacturers had learned how to dedicate their assembly lines to changing consumer demands. 
And by 1941, during World War II, there was no bigger, more demanding consumer than the United States government. I think Lewis Mumford said that really there's no kind of demand like the demand that comes about through, through warfare. Because, uh, first of all, you, you, you need a lot of things and you destroy a lot of things. It creates this tremendous demand. Here is the arsenal of democracy at work. One plant among thousands dotted across the vast United States. Detroit's automotive assembly lines transform themselves. Effectively, what you're doing is creating something entirely different. I mean, that process of conversion over to wartime industry is one where the, the whole shop floor is just uh, uh, literally in turmoil. An industry which had been geared to produce the 32 million cars currently in use by civilians refocused, retooled, and renewed its commitment to unleash the inexhaustible power of the wartime assembly line. During World War II, women and black assembly line workers earned only 60% of the white male wage. Assembly lines will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to assembly lines on Modern Marvels. I think you could say that Henry Ford invented the assembly line for the car and that uh, Toyota perfected it. After World War II, U.S. productivity was said to be eight times greater than that of Japan, which was ravaged by depression and inflation. The Toyota situation in the post-war period back in the early 50s, they really had nothing in terms of uh, resources. It was a resource-poor country. They had no opportunity, opportunity to waste. Any materials they had, they had to somehow use. In 1950, E.G. Toyota, then a young Japanese engineer hoping to rebuild his family's business, spent three months at the Rouge Complex, the most efficient car manufacturing facility in the world. Unlike many manufacturers at that time, Henry Ford was unafraid to share the unprecedented scale of his assembly line techniques with other industrialists. Ford's assembly line worked great when you had high volume and low variety, hopefully no variety, just one. But Toyota's situation was different. At that time, Toyota Motor Company was making a thousand cars a month, while the Rouge was making a thousand cars a day. And that wasn't Toyota's only problem. Here they are making a thousand cars per month. And all those, they had to make all kinds of cars. They had to make trucks, big trucks, little trucks, big cars, little cars, limousines, uh, fire engines, you name it. They had to make everything for the Japanese market. It's necessity that compels the Japanese to redefine the responsibilities of labor in a system that is starved for capital and is only serving very low volumes of demand. Unlike the highly mechanized assembly lines developed in Detroit, Toyota built their assembly lines around their primary resource, which was labor. And to do that, give them jobs that actually provide more fulfillment on the assembly line. Not only were workers required to define and improve their jobs, they were given a variety of jobs to perform. They do low-end maintenance. They do low-end uh, housekeeping. That means that you have much less support staff in the factory. You have fewer material handlers. You have fewer uh, janitors. You have fewer maintenance personnel. You have fewer inspectors. Toda said the melon, and I'd have to open my eyes to look at my hands. Your body isn't made to work at that speed. It just isn't. No part of your body. And I took a tour of every plant in the complex. And when I got to the frame plant, my eyes welled up with tears to think my mother actually performed this work. I, um, I couldn't do it. You have to. To the ingenuity, courage, and hope of its designers, engineers, and workers. President.